Cardiogenic shock, right, staying within the inpatient realm is uh, obviously in significant in terms of what it means from a prognosis standpoint. And so my aim is to really provide an, an update. Can you go to the next slide, please? All right, there are my disclosures. Next slide. Yeah, is there? Okay, perfect. That'll help, as opposed to next slide, every slide. So, so m much like probably at centers where, where you trained, um, we s are referred a number of uh, uh, patients, probably about 400 uh, per year. And our aim is simple, it's to screen for those that have end-stage heart failure, which is a diagnosis we don't take lightly because of the prognosis, more than 50% chance of dying over the next several months to a year, year and a half is best we can estimate. And so we're weighing treatment options to alter the natural progression in terms of survival and morbidity improvement related to transplant and NELVAD. But the unfortunate reality is that for many patients, um, they're too sick to jump right into transplant or LVAD. And so cardiogenic shock, whether it's post-MI or progressive uh, pump failure in, in non-ischemic, is, is an entity that's, that's real. And I put here the working definition from the shock trial um, that we see uh, every day, and, and it's, it's a syndrome. It's the inability of the heart to provide enough blood flow and oxygen to the end organs. Typically, patients have what I would qualify as more overt shock, systolic blood pressure less than 90, concomitant tachycardia. They have the physical exam clues um, related to hypoperfusion or low output with cold extremities, um, compromised pulse pressure when you fill their carotid artery or femoral arteries, and end organ dysfunction as, a, as reflective of compromised urine output. Um, now, the hemodynamic criteria as listed, but I want to highlight that you know shock when you see it based on the presentation in, in the physical exam. When it's corroborated, certainly with those with a cardiac index less than 2.2 uh, in an elevated wedge, shock is, is present. Now, I'm not going to go through the differential. Certainly, you want to exclude vasodilatory shock or sepsis syndrome, hypovolemic shock. But when you have elevated filling pressures, low output, and overt hypertension, um, you, you want to be cognizant of, of, of heart as the underlying cause. Now, complicated heart failure is not benign, and Lori mentioned uh, the ADHERE-CART model. And if you really look at it, two out of three are kidney surrogates, uh, compromised BUN, compromised kidney function, in the setting of relative hypotension, blood pressure less than 115, and in-house mortality as high as 24%. You think of how that compares to post-MI, you know, in Timmy risk stratification, around three to 5%, that's certainly alarming. And certainly those spilling troponin, even in the absence of overt shock, carry a, a poorer inpatient prognosis. Now, the easy thing in terms of estimating risk are those patients that are on the vent, multiple pressors or onotropes, where their mortality risk is more than 50% of dying within that index hospitalization. These are the patients that we would qualify as Intermax 1 and 2. Um, overt shock, certainly severe refractory shock, uh, Intermax 1, where, where their prognosis is very, very poor. And as I mentioned, these are the patients that are not candidates for major surgery let alone transplant uh, or LVAD, and highlighted on the screen when, when, when you implant or take people to major, sur to major surgery with an LVAD, their perioperative survival is significantly compromised. So really bullet point number one is the key. Severe hemodynamic instability is a well-established contraindication to permanent devices. And we'll talk about permanent devices in terms of selection and, and monitoring later in this session. So let's jump into a case presentation so we can highlight what's at our armamentarium to treat these patients. 59-year-old male, known ischemic disease, high-grade symptoms, frequent hospitalizations, which is a surrogate for poor prognosis, who's in the emergency room with uh, symptoms and signs suggestive of elevated filling pressures and, and low output, manifesting as, as uh, fluid overload and, and, and cold, cold extremities. And this gentleman was on appropriate uh, background medical therapy and will highlight chronic medical therapy aims in patients with heart failure with reduced DF. He had all the appropriate uh, uh, aggressive treatment, but many, like many of our patients have progressive uh, acute on chronic heart failure. And his physical exam, blood pressure 90, um, he was, had an underlying pace rhythm, so it was not tachycardic, um, but cool uh, extremities, 
and he had end organ dysfunction. He was actually admitted to the hospital. We got on board uh, within 24 hours, but progressive compromise in, in kidney dysfunction with persistent fluid congestion. So certainly this is an alarming case as it relates to prognosis. And again, I'm, I'm, echo is not equal shock, but you want to understand his underlying LV function, severely dilated, dilated severely depressed. Shock is a spectrum. There's overt severe refractory shock, and there's failing onotropes um, or patients progressing to potential onotrope dependency. And when we looked at this gentleman's hemodynamic corroborating the physical exam, high wedge, secondary pulmonary hypertension, predominantly left-sided heart failure, his right atrial pressure was 10, but a cardiac index on uh, onotrope therapy of, of 2.1. So, so you know, early shock, but certainly someone with an advanced heart failure profile. So the question becomes is what are our options? Now certainly you use what you can from a pharmacologic uh, standpoint with onotropes, but these really increase wall stress, and there's no good data to suggest they uh, help in terms of reducing morbidity or mortality. In fact, they are associated with uh, being proarrhythmic, and you, s you can see atrial, ventricular dysrhythmias, and it can actually complicate um, the heart failure um, 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 prognosis. So we have uh, access uh, to intraoral balloon pump, the impella devices, which I'll define, the tandem heart, which is a, a device we've been using for several years where the inflow cannula is in the left atrium, and you're taking uh, oxygenated blood and with an extracorporeal centrifugal pump deliver it into the iliac artery and in a retrograde fashion perfusing the brain and kidneys, and certainly peripheral arterial venous um, ECMO. And I'll go over the, the um, details related to each of these uh, devices and try to guide you with a working algorithm on choosing which device for, for which patient. So the balloon pump, and I know many of you all were at the uh, uh, on hands, right, boot camp session uh, yesterday. It's really been a workhorse for, for, for decades. And with inflation, you get early diastolic augmentation, which helps coronary uh, perfusion. And I'll show you the pressure volume loops as it relates to uh, helping patients with, with heart failure. And so as illustrated here on the pressure volume loop, um, the gray is the effect with intraortic balloon pump. You actually see a, a, an augmentation in stroke volume, typically around 10 to 20 uh, percent. And you initially see a, a mild decrement in systolic blood pressure, but with the augmented diastolic blood pressure, you have an increase in mean arterial pressure. And so the net reduction is, is uh, really improved, improved, uh, um, improved uh, heart performance. And I think it's important to keep in mind that a balloon pump, even though it's based on modeling, um, can improve cardiac output and improve blood pressure. Now, it's, it's modest when you compare it to the other devices. It actually has an indication not only for post-MI and acute coronary syndromes, but for heart failure, including both ischemic and non-ischemic. We're often asked, well, what is the role of a balloon pump in a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy? And it relates to that pressure volume uh, uh, loop changes, which are favorable, namely um, improving stroke volume and improving mean arterial blood pressure. So in this particular first case that I presented, in someone who's failing onotropes, worsening kidney dysfunction, we actually put in an intraoral balloon pump, um, which is first line at our institution, and the patient had significant improvement in his kidney dysfunction, improvement in his symptoms, and uh, actually we transitioned that to extended support as a bridge to transplant. With these devices, you're, you're not only trying to highlight which device for which patient, but you want to keep in the, in the back of your mind what the exit strategy will be as it relates to bridge to stability or in patients that have declared themselves bridge to transplant uh, or LVAD, and I'll show you the working uh, algorithm. So this patient uh, did quite well with extended balloon pump support. Let's highlight a second case that's more overt severe refractory shock, 41-year-old patient. Um, with uh, really non-obstructive uh, coronaries, established heart failure, who presents to the ER uh, in overt distress, systolic blood pressure 70, overt tachycardia, uh, physical exam signs uh, and, and symptoms to suggest elevated filling pressures and, and low output. And again, we'll highlight chronic medical management, been on background uh, appropriate medical therapy. And in the intensive care unit, using what you have to try to maintain uh, effective mean arterial pressure. He was on dopamine, norepinephrine, dobutamine. So certainly a gentleman who is dying, right? Go back to that. Uh, you don't need a adhere cart model to tell you that this likelihood of this guy dying without um, support is in excess of, uh, you know, 80, 80%. 80%. 
So his physical exam is highlighted here, overt pulmonary edema, um, worsening kidney function, abnormal liver function. So he's in multi-organ failure. And when you look at the details of his echocardiogram, again, you're not waiting for this to, 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 try to treat shock. Depressed EF, dilated heart. And so we have to do something different. Now, Swangan's uh, placement helps us to identify the hemodynamics. By physical exam and symptoms, you're anticipating elevated wedge low output, but you want to know what the systemic vascular resistance is. And, and normal is between 800 and, and 1,200 um, dynes per second per centimeter to the fifth. And this gentleman had uh, cardiogenic, uh, overt cardiogenic shock. And so we, as I mentioned, uh, have readily available and a balloon pump. But when you look at the, the data, we, we know balloon pump's not as robust in terms of the hemodynamic support compared to the other devices. In fact, there's a paucity of balloon pump beneficial data in general. There's a paucity of data as it relates to heart failure. When you look at the indications, it's high-risk PCI, MI with cardiogenic shock, the SHOCK2 trial, and really based on the primary endpoints as defined in this table, uh, no difference compared to medical therapy. So balloon pump utilization, in particular in, in Europe, has gone down um, um, significantly. And we know the Impella devices, namely the, the 2.5, based on um, a few trials, ISER shock and PROTECT2, does offer more uh, hemodynamic uh, support. So at our institution, you know, while we have it readily available and can be placed at the bedside, in a patient like this with more overt shock, understanding his potential response in, in increments of hours is going to be key and anticipating needing uh, to do more. So doing more relates to impella devices, tandem heart, or peripheral AV ECMO. Now, as uh, illustrated yesterday, the impella devices, the two and a half, which offers the least support, is a nine French uh, system. Um, that's favorable in terms of it being a smaller platform. The CP's uh, 4.0 is a 14 French, outer diameter 16 French, and the one that's really changed our institution algorithm is the Impella 5.0, which I'll uh, uh, define. It really requires the use of a, of a graft, and so this, ma man this mandates managing this uh, in a, either a hybrid suite or, or in a cath lab, but you have to have a surgical cut down, typically the right axillary artery, use of a, a 10 millimeter Dacron graft, and the Impella device is placed in, across the aortic valve, and it's a microaxial uh, flow pump, and blood is, is sucked, if you will, or propelled from the left ventricle to the aorta to perfuse the brain and, uh, and, and organs. And it offers robust support. Here's an example of a patient in the intensive care unit, and you can dial in the revolutions per minute of this microaxial flow pump, P2 being very low support, equivalent of around one to two liters per minute, and as exemplified on the slide, this patient had overt, more overt uh, hypotension, requiring the impella to begin with, a mean of 64 at low levels of support with an elevated wedge. And within several minutes, just dialing up to higher flow around a little over four liters per minute, you can appreciate dynamic changes, favorable dynamic changes in terms of improvement in mean blood pressure and reduction in wedge. And this is what you want, right, to achieve to, to, to support patients. Now the tandem heart, over significant hemodynamic support, much like the Impella 5.0. Um, now, it requires a 21 French, typically 21 French venous uh, uh, sheath, which goes across the interatrial septum. The arterial sheath, you have one of two options, 15 or 17 French um, outflow. So you have to have interatrial septal puncture uh, technical capability. So that's one of, one of the challenges, um, and this uh, typically mandates the use of fluoroscopy and the use of the cath lab. But as illustrated here, Lower versus higher level support, you can augment blood pressure and, and uh, reduce pulmonary pressure. So both uh, offer equivalent support. And there's really a paucity of data comparing um, um, these devices uh, against each other. Uh, tandem versus balloon pump, we certainly know that there's much more hemodynamic support with a tandem heart. Again, indications were a AMI with cardiogenic shock and, and uh, just a small randomized versus balloon pump in the setting of uh, all-comer cardiogenic shock. So superior hemodynamic benefit with these more uh, uh, overt devices. Now, a key concept in terms of LV pressure volume loops, again, gray being the effect once the impella or tandem are put in. It reduces LV filling pressure uh, as well as LV volumes and stroke volume. So if you dial up high enough and the heart is sick enough, your entire mean blood pressure may be generated by the pump. So it's an assist pump, but it could be a replacement pump in those that have the inability to eject above that level um, of support. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on peripheral AV ECMO. Um, it has the benefit of biventricular support and can help rapidly with gas, uh, with gas exchange abnormalities related to acidemia 
and overt hypoxia with the use of a gas exchange unit. Um, a key concept to remember is that peripheral AV ECMO actually, um, actually reduces uh, LV stroke volume and increases LV systolic and diastolic pressures. So wedge can come up, right? Your retrograde challenge of, 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 of the LV. And specifically, when you're using higher levels of support, as exemplified in the slide, ECMO 4.5 liters, you get higher LVEDP. This is exactly the opposite of what you want, right, to treat with something. So you're using peripheral AV and ECMO to restore blood pressure, acid, correct acidemia, and improve oxygenation in the order of, uh, you know, 30-minute intervals. So a concept, and this is getting a lot of uh, recognition, is the concept of venting. So if you know peripheral AV ECMO is gonna increase uh, filling pressures, left-sided filling pressures, your options are either couple it with a, an impella-type device or at least with an inch to balloon pump. Some people do it medically with a Swanigan's catheter and continued onotropes and diuresis. You wanna keep your wedge low. Last thing you want is an ECMO bridge with frothy pulmonary edema, abnormal chest X-ray because of the lack of venting when you're considering an exit strategy. So these, this is a detailed description of, of the different types of devices. I think it's key that the larger arterial platforms, greater leg ischemic and potential bleeding risk, you wanna go through your contraindications for each of the devices while you're weighing what you need in terms of hemodynamic support and mechanical aortic valve, for example, a severe peripheral vascular disease will certainly be contraindications to, uh, to the impella uh, CP, but that's where the impella 5 helps out in terms of peripheral vascular disease. In patients with a right, uh, right or left atrial thrombus um, um, or a very small LA, tandem may be more challenging. And so the different etiologies of shock, we all know this quite well, uh, above and beyond just uh, uh, post-MI. Uh, and these devices can help you in, in multiple scenarios. And going back to our more complicated case, we actually, this was several years back, put a tandem heart in, uh, which allowed us to uh, bridge this gentleman to stability He's now two and a half years out um, doing well. He was a poor transplant and LVAD candidate because of the severity of his presentation and allowed us to, an opportunity to put him on guideline-directed therapy. So in summary, early shock, take advantage of the hemodynamics. Balloon pump, in my mind, is, is first line, more severe refractory hygienic shock. You're gonna wanna use what you can in terms of your local expertise, but the Impella 5 or Tandem offer the most overt support. In, in dire distress, which can be readily implemented, is an AV ECMO, but consider it concomitant um, LV venting. And so this concept of a shock team certainly uh, is easy to understand when you're doing transplant in LVAD, and it's really a multidisciplinary collaborative effort with working with surgeons, heart failure specialists, interventionalists, and ICU team to take care of these patients. So just briefly, this is our uh, algorithm, if you will, patients presenting with cardiogenic shock, if severe refractory without overt hypoxia acidemia, we think it's predominantly left-sided, Swangan plus balloon. Um, if they're failing as measured, the, as measured in increments of 30 minutes to an hour or two, as it relates to acidemia, uh, urine output, we'll upgrade the, the device. And we always have in mind, is this a bridge to recovery or destination or, or to an LVAD or to transplant uh, improved candidacy? Some people, you put this in and they're, they're gonna die. And, you're, you're, they're not getting better, and so palliative care is certainly uh, appropriate in that scenario. So becoming familiar with what you have readily available, um, uh, gaining that expertise, I think it will help you uh, help your patients uh, at your particular institutions. So I appreciate your attention with shock, and here's a, a picture of our team, if you will. Thank you.